Hey everyone, this is Charlie Shrem, and you're listening to Untold Stories. This is a show where we dive deep into the lives and personal histories of some of crypto's most influential leaders and find out how the crypto movement truly came to be. Let's dive in. This episode of Untold Stories is sponsored by Scott Offord, the creator of Crypto Mining. Scott's a broker of ASIC mining gear and helps people buy and sell their miners. He created a Bitcoin mining profitability calculator and an interactive ASIC hardware comparison chart that you can find at CryptoMining.Tools. It's the only free online tool for calculating profitability and days to ROI. That includes the impact of the Bitcoin block reward having. The calculator lets you put in your estimated uptime to give you a more realistic profit projections. So check it out and find Scott on Telegram and Twitter at O-F-F-O-R-D-S-C-O-T-T. That's O-F-F-O-R-D-S-C-O-T-T. Links are in the show notes. This episode of Untold Stories is sponsored by eToro, the smartest crypto trading platform and one of the largest in the world with over $1 trillion in trading volume per year. U.S. customers can trade the most popular crypto assets with low and transparent fees. And if you're not ready to trade yet, practice building your crypto portfolio with the eToro $100,000 virtual trading feature. Best of all, you can connect with 11 million other eToro traders around the world, myself included, to discuss trading, charts, and all things crypto. Create an account at eToro.com. Links in the show notes and build your crypto portfolio the smart way. Untold Stories is powered by Blockworks Group, the only event and podcast production company I trust. For access to the premier digital asset conferences and in-depth podcast content, Visit them at BlockWorksGroup.io. That's BlockWorksGroup.io. I promise you will not be disappointed. I know I say this a lot, but I truly am so excited about my next guest. I usually jump into this long intro introducing them, but Elena Vranova does not need an introduction because I guarantee you every single listener of my show has used one of her products before. And it's very interesting because... Most people, like I was telling her earlier before the show started, most people just do, but she just keeps on doing and launching amazing things. For example, in 2011, she was the founder of Satoshi Labs, which you all know, um, basically brought out, it was the first, uh, Satoshi Labs was one of the first companies that brought out uh, infrastructure in the crypto space, in the Bitcoin world, I like to say, coinmap.org, which was the first Bitcoin map, so you could find out where in the world places are accepting and using Bitcoin. Slush Pool, one of the first Bitcoin mining pools and and one of the largest. Uh, the Trezor, you guys all use the Trezor. I use the Trezor, the, one of the first hardware wallets and still till today, my favorite hardware wallet. And now she is the head of strategy at Casa Hodel. Elena, thank you so much for coming on the show. Well, thank you very much, Charlie. You've done a very generous intro to me. Uh, the energy is real. I that, thank you. I don't want to uh, take unjust uh, uh, credits for uh, some of the things that you mentioned. Uh, so just to, to straighten up the record, uh, I am the co-founder of Satoshi Labs, uh, together with Slush and Stick. Uh, they go um, both go by by nicknames. Uh, and Slush has created the Slush Pool, the first mining pool before we even met. So I don't want to take credit for that. But Satoshi Labs in general kind of was this umbrella organization for all the uh, all the projects that we've been developing. And, um, you know, there was a coin map uh, done by Stick very early 2013. And then we redesigned it once. But the major... Um, development under Satoshi Labs was Trezor, the hardware wallet. So just to just to be fair. <laughs> so that's that's awesome of you to say because it takes a very humble person to be able to recognize the other people that deserve credit for things. And it's very difficult to find um, amazing executives and amazing people that you can work with. So that's really great that you founded... Um, these projects with mm-hmm. with Slush, who I've spoken to dozens and dozens of times, but you and I have never actually met before, which is very surprising because I thought I had pretty much met every person in the space. <laughs> yes, I don't know how that happened. We have to also correct this <laughs> soon in the yes, future. Yes, for sure. I hope. 
so you you also come from very humble beginnings. You um, identify as Czechoslovakian, which is super cool. I I love that because, as my listeners will know, there's two countries nowadays: is the Czech Republic and the Slovakia. Mm-hmm. And but and the, I think I think there are a lot of parallels in the Bitcoin world to what happened to Czechoslovakia. So you know. Um, you identify as Czechoslovakian. Your, I think you said your 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 mother is Slovakian and your father is Czech. Mm-hmm, exactly. And so you grew up in this world where everyone was the same. You were all Czechoslovakian. It there was no separate cultures. It's like in the United States, if the North and the South end up becoming two separate countries, and people start identifying as Southerner or nor- Northerner, um, do 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 a lot of people in in Czech Republic and Slovakia today identify the same way you do? Or is it I'm Czech or I'm Slovakian? No, actually, the two little nations uh, have almost nothing in common throughout the history. Uh, and, and both nations are quite different in nature, in culture and history, in in the way they're thinking. Like there's huge differences. The way, you know, Czechoslovakia came to existence was a purely political project. After the First World War, you know, there was all these Slavic nations in Europe were suffering. So uh, our political leaders thought it would be great to create like a pan-Slavic state. Okay, pan-Slavic meaning connecting all the Slavic countries uh, and nations in the in Europe, which did not happen. Uh, there was not enough support and it was way too scattered and everyone had their own interests. And so basically it happened between Czechs and Slovaks, right? But Slovakia was always this little, quite poor country. Uh, for 1,000 years, it was part of Austrian Hungary. Okay, so no, no sovereignty at all for the country. And compared to Czechs and and the Bohemian country, where right? Bohemia was uh, a beautifully like cultural and very historically significant uh, country, the seat of. Uh, kings and Caesars, right? So it um, it had a, like the two countries have almost nothing in common, except for a little tiny period in the, in the history, which uh, led my mom and my dad together, just like many others uh, in Czechoslovakia. And, and so you have a fairly decent amount of people that could say they're Czechoslovak, uh, but but it's really uh, a different nation, different country, different mind. The Czech Republic is known um, for engineering and mass producing uh, hardware. And so when you guys originally launched the Trezor um, and and then I read that it was it's a Czech company, I was like, oh, well, I know this is great because um, you guys produce, I mean, like a lot of the weapons, a lot of the guns in the world today and actually Interestingly enough, I have a, a jet surf board. I'm not sure if you've heard of this before, but the jet surf was the concept was invented and they're all produced in the Czech Republic today. And I have one. It's basically a surfboard with a jet ski engine in it. Wow. Um, and I live in Florida, so it's amazing. But it's produced in the Czech Republic. All the parts I have to get are from the Czech Republic. And it's okay. a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. I had no idea. You see, yeah, we have a saying. Uh, it says the Czech, golden Czech hands. And that means that Czechs are extremely innovative and, and extremely like this. We are a do-it-yourself culture, you know, and that this was, I think that's a heritage from the communist times as well, uh, where, you know, everyone had the same like the other ones, which meant almost nothing. And so if you wanted something different <laughs> or special, uh, then you had to figure out a way how to create it yourself. Um, and so it was very typical for women, uh, for my moms and, uh, you know, grandmoms to sew and knit and, and produce clothes and uh, for our dads to uh, fix their cars and, and create, you know, whatever they wanted to. <laughs> so, And I think th- it's true. Uh-huh. So there is a lot of um, uh, um, innovative thinking. We have a fairly good technical uh, education. Um, so a lot of brain power here, uh, a little bit less on the, let's say sales and marketing and, you know, investment side, but, uh, when it comes to technical skills, yes, Czechoslovakia used to be even like 
before the Second World War, one of the top 10 economies in the world. Thanks to, thanks to this wit. <laughs> so let's go back 10 years. Let's go back. Let's, let's turn on the, um, let's turn on the time machine here. The way back machine. Let's go to the way back machine. Actually, funny side story, the way back machine, archive.org. Um, Brewster Kale is a ph phenomenal guy who, who owns the, the way back machine archive, the, the internet archive foundation. And, um, funny story about him <clears throat> In 2000, because you, you brought that up, in 2013, he actually tried, he founded a bank here in, in New Jersey, in the U.S., called um, the Internet Credit Union. And and this was like in the early days of Bitcoin. And so he's founded a bank. And I was actually one of the, he only had a few hundred accounts. I had an account at the Internet Credit Union. And it was, um, it got shut down eventually. You know, they quickly got rid of it. But for a while, it was a real bank. And I had a debit card and I had a, a bank account number. He's very libertarian and loves Bitcoin. And um, so that's a totally a total side point. But let's go back in our own way back machine here. Let's get some untold stories. So the year is 2010 and you're studying at the University College of International and Public Relations. That's a very long name of a school in Prague. <laughs> yes. And you're studying for economic diplomacy. What imagine if Bitcoin never existed, what would you have done? What did you want to do? I would be sad <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay so um you know i went to study that school because despite working in uh, traditional finance you know i never had like an actual financial education my education was rather languages and um uh, marketing communication and, and some creative stuff um and so i and Somehow I landed in, in finance, in risk management and insurance, building businesses, right? And then the crisis happened and I realized, okay, Alena, you know nothing about uh, the financial world, actually. So I went on to study this and uh, money what was... What is a, economic diplomacy? Um, you know, it, it was a broad uh, spectrum of topics. We uh, had a very intense uh, study of history and uh, history of diplomacy so which is a layer on top of the usual uh, th history books that you read it was like who negotiated what and why and how uh and that gives you kind of a better understanding of how the world turns and why uh nation states and rulers decide the way they do and why they say uh, what they say don't say what they don't say right uh and then um there was a big part dedicated to macroeconomy and um uh you know profiling each countries how how they how their economies work what their problems gonna be in the future uh trying to think forward right and i realized that you know money is at the epicenter of it all and that's the tool of power and i want to see and I understood why, you know, one country issuing internationally accepted and global currency could be a systemic problem. And so you know, there I was um, in digging into different kind of monies, right? Local currencies and uh, lead systems uh, up to the point of studying international monetary funds, SDRs, there was a special drawing rights idea that never really took off and they're trying to revive it in the recent years uh, and you know i was just researching and also talking to friends and i found bitcoin and i was like i had a feeling okay this 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 was the purpose why i studied so how did you um find out about bitcoin i just found it i was researching online i was looking for all forms of money and hoping to to find in my thesis uh, a better form of money, a better form of global money. And it was like, surprise, surprise, Elena, if you're looking for something, well, uh, here some Satoshi Nakamoto has written a paper and some people are starting to talk about it. And then I was lucky to have some good, good friends around me that are kind of, you know, hackers, nerds, thinkers. And um, one of them, uh, came to visit Prague and he, he came to my house and we just spent the entire night just talking about Bitcoin and, and he was explaining stuff to me. 
and I was like, oh, holy crap, like this is gonna, this is gonna be huge, right? And he was like, giving me this conspiracy look. And that was 2000. Can, I still get that look. <laughs> I still, <laughs> yeah, you know, still, which what are you talking about? Yes. And then um, 2011, Amir Taki uh, organized the first Bitcoin conference in, yes, Pra- Amir. in Prague. Yes, Amir. I miss Amir. <laughs> yes, he's still around. He's doing some, some uh, you, uh, as usual, some crazy things that he does. And one of these crazy things that he did and the great things that he did was this conference because there was uh, the first European conference. I think the first American Bitcoin conference happened just like two weeks prior to that. So it was like a t- tiny space, probably November to eleven. And I went there, of course, because it was in my town. And I saw Max Kaiser on stage talking about, uh, you know, his uh, his beloved topics, monetary, uh, uh, more monetary topics and banking. And who else did you meet at this conference? And there was Slush at the conference, and there was uh, Simon Dixon from Bank to the Future. Imagine back then, like uh, wow, and, and he's still around. Um, and, you know, I, I met, uh, uh, I think both uh, Slush and Stick, but, you know, they were super nerdy and I was like the, the business girl. <laughs> um, so it was uh, to find the ways, especially if, you know, someone is deep down in, in the technology and you're on like the other side of, of the world seeming, seems like, right. At, the, at that time, it's difficult to pick up uh, a conversation, but, I was lucky and we were lucky again to meet um, in later, like 2013 in March uh, on some random, random security conference in Brno. And I was just there because I had a crazy night partying with my business partners from some insurance company. And uh, I think I was pretty decently hangover, <laughs> hungover. And then I went to just see my friend talking at this conference and there's Slush again. And and he starts to tell me about uh, the idea of creating a hardware wallet, which a, f- a few people have explored before, but nobody succeeded to do it well. And I was like, oh, that's that's super interesting. Uh, well, why don't we connect and meet again in Prague? And so we met a few times uh, and I've just found it more and more and more fascinating. And I've thought like, yes, users need to hold their keys themselves. Like there's no way we will, uh, we should run these risks. And I offered my help and I basically just, offered my help for, you know, a little bit. (laughs) I said, I'm going to help you a little bit because I was at at that time, uh, the head of external sales and business development at Societe Generale, which is, which was a very, uh, you know, responsible duty (laughs) and, uh, working quite a lot, but then, you know, it, it, it really, um, was exciting. We, we set up the crowdfunding for Tezer in what may june 2013 and back then bitcoin was 90 dollars and so we would we we said hey if you if you want the treasure send us one bitcoin and if you want a metallic casing like i still want the metallic casing well well, it's too late they're gone i know my (laughs) friend has one he won't sell it to me the the first editions are gone i've recently found one after moving houses i found one in a box and i gave it away in a Twitter i have to check ebay <laughs> let me i want to hear about the crowdfund but i want to give you my perspective really quick mm-hmm. um and i want the listeners to have a, a certain perspective before you tell this the story of the founding of of trezor is that before trezor existed there were no hardware wallets um nowadays the hardware wallet is is as well known as your cell phone. You know, you there isn't a question about should I use a hardware wallet? The question is which one should I use? And the field is full. There are dozens and dozens of different ones. I literally have on my office, I have a stack of different ones. I have the BC Vault, I have Trezors, I have the Jupiter one, I have the Ledger, I have of course my Trezors. I have 
dozens of them because I like playing with all different ones, right? Keep key. Funny story. I almost bought keep key, but that's another story for another time. But um, what's w- interesting is that in 2013, when uh, 2014, when I went to prison, there there were no hardware wallets. Um, I was using exclusively blockchain.info because um, I liked the fact that with blockchain.info at the time, now they don't you they don't do this anymore. But the way blockchain.info was set up, their wallet back then, before they went to the HD wallet, was that you can have your um, your password, which encrypted your wallet, and then you can have a secondary password that you can re-encrypt your wallet and have multiple, multiple wallets re-encrypted in that. So if someone got your original password, and I like that, the double encryption. But when the hardware wallet first came out, I first got out of jail, and... Um, I was talking to my friend, my friend George Mandrick. I don't know if you know him. He actually was the at the time, the head of customer service for Blockchain.info, and I emailed him. Actually, we were living in the same town in Pennsylvania, and I messaged him. This was 2016, mm-hmm. and I said, "Hey, I'm out of jail. I need to unlock my my Blockchain.info wallet because he essentially turned off, he turned on the two factor authentication for me that." went to a cell phone that basically never existed because I was nervous that while I was in prison, someone could port my phone number and, hmm. and take my, my, my crypto. So he, he, um, um, turned it off for me and I was able to, and he's like, Hey, like, I know I work for blockchain.info, but there's this really cool hardware wallet called the Trezor that I have one and you should try. And I'm like, no, I don't really want to do that. I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with, with what I'm doing now. And he's like, dude, like, trust me, you have to use. And Mandrick actually was the, Head of customer service for a bit instant from 2012 to 2013. And so I trusted him a lot. And so he said, you got to do it. And I said, no, I'm not going to do it. And he came over. He literally showed up at my house with uh, with a Trezor. And he's like, here, use this freaking thing now or else I'm going to punch you in the face, basically. Oh. And I was like, all right, all right. And that's what that's when I got hooked. OK, thank you, Mandrick. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Mandrake. And I'm gonna have him on the show because he has some crazy stories. He's worked at a lot of um a lot of the early Bitcoin companies. So take me back to the crowd sale. So wait, I have a question. Why didn't you do a token sale for Trezor? <laughs> uh it was a token sale actually. You know, we, we were just not distributing but you any, actually got something out of it. We did not distribute any actual crypto tokens. We distributed a promise, right? We said uh, if you send us money, we will do this. And we did that. We were late, though. Um, and we, you know, we made a few mistakes on the way. We learned a ton of stuff. Uh, uh, but you, when you look at it, it was in a way people would entrust us their money because they saw there's a there's an actual need for for something more secure and usable for an everyday person. And they gave us the trust. Uh, one of the reasons I think it was because they've known Slush and that helped. Slush has created the first mining pool. Um, his pool was hacked and he, you know, um, covered the, the losses from his pocket. And so he had this social credit somehow <laughs> that was very helpful um, uh, to start with. Um People back then didn't know me, although I was quite a, a successful um, business developer already. I had a few, a few big businesses behind me, but I was new to Bitcoin space, so that was that was kind of helpful. Um, and there was probably less disappointments back then, so people were more apt to to believe, to trust, right? And um, at the same time, you know, we did the, the crowdfund on, on purely on Bitcoin. No PayPal, no fiat money. We were like heavy Bitcoiners. And if we want to build up the, you know, Bitcoin economy, we... Wait, we sh- were or are heavy Bitcoiners? Were and are. Like- <laughs> okay, good. I just want to make sure. <laughs> yeah, that, that bug that I caught in 2010, just I can't get rid of it. So. Um. Um, so we we went pure pure Bitcoin in the crowdfunding. It just made things so much easier. We because we tried to create a, a Kickstarter campaign on Kickstarter.com, and they they made everything possible to stop us. First of all, 
What do you mean? mm -hmm. So we submitted our campaign to Kickstarter and, you know, there's a procedure that you have to go through and they, I think I never got a clear answer, but I think they didn't like that it's Bitcoin. Uh, and they kept asking us for extremely detailed plans. They wanted the entire code base for Trezor way before we could even finish. They wanted like a lot of schemes of, of the hardware and stuff. And, and so it took weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. And then we, we were like, damn, well, we should fundraise us all. You know what? Screw that. Let's, let's set up our eShop purely on Bitcoin uh, and let's do it. And so we did, uh, it turns out like we did it just shortly before the, the huge rally in 2013. So we started when Bitcoin was $90 and within a few months, uh, Bitcoin was on what, 12, 1200 from $90 to, to 1000 and something. And so, and we were still working on the project. And so some people, uh, got nervous and they wanted to speculate and they, they wanted the money back. And then we had some delay in the, in the manufacturing. So they called us scammers. They called us butterfly labs too. Um, butterfly Lab. <laughs> you remember butterfly labs. That was I, I remember it, but most people are listening to this show. have no idea what we're talking about. And they're probably Googling butterfly labs right now. <laughs> okay. Butterfly. But that's labs. why we're here to educate people. But yeah, tell us what it was. Uh, it, it, it was a mining uh, hardware project producer right and they got kind of sadly famous for um pre-selling their mining hardware um and then it took them forever to to deliver and they would they got also famous for the in two weeks uh, uh quote because they kept promising like in two weeks that's what they kept saying and this was pre-asic right this wasn't asics this was a gpu that i think it was still a gpu yeah yeah. So this wasn't even like... Or one of the first uh, technical... All specs. mining today all mining today is done... Almost all Bitcoin mining today, like you would say what 100% or 99.9% of Bitcoin mining today is done on ASICs because they are mm -hmm. just 10 times more efficient and better at mining Bitcoin. But this was so long ago yeah. that this I was still graphics card... Um, graphics cards it's possible i don't remember the, the technical specs anymore but the the uh the problem wasn't that they kept postponing the problem was that they actually produced the hardware they mined a bunch of bitcoin with this hardware and they started to ship the hardware to the to the actual owners uh, long after it was profitable for them to mine right so they they would ship used machines and uh that was a that was a huge scam so so uh, people were accusing you of being like another butterfly lab basically. yes and that was what year was this that was hard to that was 2013 still um because we promised to deliver uh, the hardware wallets around october 2013 and we were on a good path towards it but then our uh manufacturer failed us uh failed us big time and he he kept postponing and so when when we were you know in november and heading to december i knew that i have to find a new manufacturer but you know picking up negotiations with new manufacturers that usually takes a few months until you settle on the contract and everything so basically we we delivered the product uh, with some 6 or 8 months late right so it hurt it was weird because uh, you know i I always was very um, uh, fair in, in any business that I did. And I had always had a very good reputation for, you know, um, having great business relations, uh, relations. And then being accused of, of being scammers and knowing that it's painful for the people because they think they may have been scammed, but they don't know. And, uh, you know, all the pressure was extreme, extreme. And... I was still working at SG, so I had two jobs. I was, for nine months, I would work, you know, nine to five in the bank, in the insurance company, and then go to our, um, not even our office, but uh, an office of, of our friends and stay up, you know, all nights until 3, 4 a.m. and then sleep three hours. So I was, you know, exhausted and I had my inbox full of people that were pissed and, and, wanted their bitcoins back 
<laughs> and plus we were handling, you know, the learning process because none of the three had ever produced any hardware. <laughs> we were well. Like, let me ask you a question. Yeah. Did the concept of hardware wallets exist before this? Like, wh where did you get that idea from? Because mm -hmm. the idea existed. Yeah. So the, the the concept was tested by several people. You know, people would try to build some Raspberry Pis and like uh, create it. There was um, if if you I, I'm sure when you Google or you go to uh, Bitcoin Wiki that you will find some very early. Um, early I'll tell you. attempts. I'll tell you the answer. Yes. Um, and this is a very unknown story. And it's a very, very unknown story. And I should keep it that way. But <laughs> the first, I, as I know it, hardware wallet actually was conceptualized by the former mayor of a town in Russia called, um, his name is Sasha. Oh. I don't want to say his real name, but um, that's his nickname. Okay. And he was an oil uh, ogliarch, and um, in 2012, he brought, he flew out almost uh, early, all the early crypto people to Vienna to help him build what he was calling the Bitcoin card. And the people, uh, Nath from, yes. from Bitstamp was there, Amir Taki was there, I was there, Eric Voorhees was there, Roger Veer was there. Um, and, and obviously, he never launched it. It, it failed completely, but... Um, that was, for what I know, was the original um, hardware wallet that was conceptualized. Uh, there was, um, hmm, let me let me go to this to to the web page and and look it up. There were several. So um, the way uh, Slash and Stick got to to come back to the idea was because they saw some presentation of of some German professor who tried to do it as well with his students and failed. Uh, and there was uh, another hardware wallet. And I just, you know, my, my memory is so bad. But I'm trying to... Um, While you're to thinking of that, I I'm, want to ask you where the Trezor name comes from. Oh, Trezor is a very uh, usual word in my language, both in Czech and Slovak, and means a safe box. Uh, you know, safety box. Oh, so I can go to Czech Republic and and go to walk into a bank and say, "Hey, I want to open up a Trezor." Yes. <laughs> really? Yes. I'm going to go try that. <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, oh, here I got it. I found it. So, uh, so m my team was inspired by Professor Clemens Kapp. Uh, he tried to to do um, uh, something something with his uh, students and then but there was like a lot of work done around that time of 2011-12 uh there's some bit clip project or it's at least a concept uh then jim jim from multi multi-bit if you remember multi-bit multi-bit yes well, so jim actually was the one who founded the keep key uh well uh no no, I'm, I'm confusing he, he, him. Yeah, no, but you know, you you don't confuse the person. You we're talking about the same gym from Multibit, uh, but Kipki acquired Multibit. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. Got it now. Uh, but Jim was involved in the space, you know, for a long time, and they... I spoke to him a few months ago. He's brilliant. Yes. Yeah, I loved. I always loved him. So, uh, and he was writing about you know some dedicated Bitcoin devices uh, uh, that that should deal with un untrusted networks. So that, the the idea was around. It was just like nobody uh, sit sat down and made it happen and made it happen in a user friendly way and in a mass uh, production, right? As a mining equipment broker, Scott Offered wants to make sure his clients are well-informed and making data-backed business decisions. Scott created the only free online tool for calculating profitability and days to ROI for miners. It's a better way to compare the efficiency of various models of ASIC miners and to see how the price of the miner and the efficiency impacts your mining profitability. So check it out at CryptoMining.Tools and find Scott on Telegram and Twitter at O-F-F-O-R-D-S-C-O-T-T. -T. That's O F F O R D. S C O T T. Etoro's crypto trading made easy. It's one of the largest and smartest trading platforms in the world with low and transparent fees. Join myself and 11 million other traders and create an account today 
at etoro.com. Links in the show notes. And build your crypto portfolio the smart way. The the multi, I was a little sad, actually, that um, when Shapeshift, Eric Voorhees, they acquired KeepKey and Multibit, they actually, they're, they're um, sunsetting Multibit. And I was a little sad about that because Multibit was one of the first um, wallet implementations that... Uh, software wallet implementations that wasn't um bitcoin core or before bitcoin core was called bitcoin core it was there were a few other implementations but that was one of the first ones um i was a little sad about that well the at least the way you know i understood it uh, at the time we we Trezor and and multibit cooperated of course there was a they were one of the first or maybe even the first wallet uh that that implemented Trezor support and so obviously when this, um, you know, news started to come, come about, I was like, hey, Jim, uh, what are the plans? And the plans supposedly were to maintain multi-bit to further develop it. And, you know, and of course, I had a feeling that's not going to be the case. And I was unfortunately right. How did you come up with the design for for the Trezor? Uh this is like mainly uh, if you if you're asking about the architecture and about you know the oh the, the, the physical what it what it looks like and and the buttons and and I mean the teardrop shape that you guys created in the small instead of doing it as a card you did it as a little um, like a elongated version or a larger version of a USB dongle mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean how was that design conceptualized by you and the team um, and I know you guys are all famous for developing great hardware but the um it worked like the design is very aesthetically pleasing and it doesn't um and then you know the model the your your next model the model t it it's while it has an, uh, a larger screen this the, the the actual design and the um the you know the curved lines and the square and what it looks like is still very much similar to your first model so what i'm trying to figure out is how did you come up with that that concept hmm. well I mean, we try to be minimalistic, right, in everything that, that that we did, and that also goes to the code base and to keep a simple code, you know, and to keep something that's easy, simple to use and doesn't have too many things that that aren't necessary. So, you know, you may remember some other attempts for hardware wallets that that promised fingerprint scanners and. And wanted to have Bluetooth and uh, SIM card slots and whatnot, and and that all adds a huge complexity. So when you you know if you open the treasure, you find out that it's a very actually very simple product. There's <laughs> there's a processor, there's a you know there's a few uh, things on the on the PCB, but but basically that's it. And the second thing was like how looking at, at the user experience of how one would operate with it. And so we wanted something that a person could easily, nicely keep in the hand and use the, the thumb to, you know, just like you use on your phone, right? And so th- th- that's how we came with this with this simplistic design, um, yeah. It was it, it was a huge learning process, you know. We have uh, uh, some some hacker friends. So, well, Stick, my co-founder, he he also co-founded the first hackerspace in in Prague, and so there was a friend who who helped us with the initial PCB design, and then we had like a professional company, you know, that rewired, uh, made it a a little bit more efficient. But basically, that that was it. The more like troublesome stuff for us was to just understand uh, the the processes and everything that comes with creating electronics because it was not anymore uh, a piece of software that you just deploy and that's it right you have to think about stuff like sourcing components and lead times production times uh distribution logistics uh customs uh packaging insurance uh paying taxes around it um how you know like the topic of this is so complex um and plus you have to run the company right you need to hire people and do marketing and do the communication stuff so when you're sourcing when you're sourcing all these components are you telling your 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 uh 
your hardware uh, sources what you're doing? Are you no. saying I'm building a so yeah. what did you tell them? No, so the the way one of the things like we were aware is that we need to absolutely minimize risk exposure. Um, so we would source uh, com- components through someone else, and that someone else uh, is a specialized company. Uh, they um, could never share any diagrams or any plans. Uh, they just basically uh, source those components ideally from very different uh, companies. Right? So the trick is, uh, you you know, despite sourcing components from China, well. That is the case for, unfortunately, for most of the world and most of the electronics that we use today. Uh, we at least try to not give anyone any idea what, what what we're doing, right? And what is this for? But how, I mean, surely they were curious. <laughs> and so whether they didn't ask you, maybe they were trying to think about it or figure it out what you need these components for. No, these components um, are very standard components used in many other uh, pieces of electronics. So it was just the usual, uh, even rather small orders, you know, small batches for them. <laughs> so they okay, I, good because I, that's the, I, yeah. the that's a big fear for people have. It's like what? Um, how do we know from a hardware level that you know no one could hmm. install something like a little keylogger or whatever? But it, yeah, well, at least with this uh, little device, you can you can validate yourself that you're running the actual Satoshi Labs uh, firmware. You can theoretically, if you know how, you can build your own and compare the fingerprints uh, and, uh, or ask someone to do it for you. If if you want to be that level of paranoid, uh, there is an option. Uh, besides, I made sure that that the, the production is extremely well guarded. That nobody knows. Uh, which company, where, that even employees of that manufacturer have very restricted access. Only certain employees can access uh, any of the separate, you know, production facility, facility that we had. So we we were also lucky to have a, a, a highly, very professional uh, manufacturer that was like a um a blessing for us you know he they led us through a lot of these processes and I'm very grateful for that nowadays we have an amazing hardware wallet and a lot of the hardware wallets that exist today kind of came out of yours mm-hmm. and and your teams and so that's you know thank you we're very grateful for that and so you you moved on and um you're you're involved now with the founding team of Casa Hodel, but before we get to that, because I actually have one of those too. I'm a paying I'm a paying subscriber of you guys. I'm a paying member. I love it. Before we get to that, though, tell me about your childhood. Tell me about growing up. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I should not indicate the time when I was born because everyone will <laughs> no know one does. How, Don't worry. <laughs> how old I? <laughs> But let's say I, I, I grew up, you know, in this uh, small town in Slovakia in, um, I've, uh, as a single child, but uh, with very loving parents and uh, very supportive parents. So I think I, despite growing up in uh, communism and dark, uh, the dark age of, <laughs> of our history, um, I, I had a very, very good uh, environment and uh, you know, my mom supported me a lot in in whatever I wanted to study, and I wanted to study it all. Like I was super uh, bookworm. Um, I was quite a shy <laughs> girl uh, when I was a child, um, and then you know, I saw I wasn't aware that much of what's going on. You know, as a four, five, seven year old, you're just enjoying your life, and you take what is. Right? You, you, the, that's your reality, and uh, and but then November eighty nine came, and uh, I'm sitting uh, in front of the TV, like the you know the late news, and and there's there's police beating up people, and there's people on the streets with their keys, and I'm like a scared little girl, and I was like, Mom, are we at war? And they go and they start laughing and say, "No, this is great. This is actually good. Now finally we can tell you the truth." And for me, I was like, "Wow, 
what just happened and and they they explained to me like you know whenever you came from school and and you were happy that you just learned a new poem about lenin we had to be quiet because if we told you something and you would speak about that in school we would end up in jail so this was the fall of communism yes exactly that was the velvet... as a, yeah as a child for you um did you understand what was going on and why it was so important well th th that was you know i was uh i was quite uh, on the verge of 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 uh, my teenage and it took me a while but then then you know we started to learn things that people kind of knew but nobody talked about because all all the system was based basically on mass surveillance right yeah, like the the art stb which was uh, something like the soviet kgb so we had our own um, state security and the state security's uh, tactic uh, was to to push normal citizens to surveil on their relatives on their friends on their co-workers and inform so those were the informants and the problem was like you never know who's the informant it could be your husband could be you could be well like you physically like like you're informing on yourself like i don't know uh, well yeah but that at least you're aware of <laughs> true story uh, um <laughs> because they would it's not that people would want to inform it's that they would they would for example they tell you inform on your um on inform on your cousin because if you don't we're gonna take your mm -hmm. husband into prison yeah or you know gonna, what choice did you have yes or you're gonna lose your job and and you're gonna work as a if you know insert any uh low graded uh, job title that you that you want so um even like pushing people to be a part of the communist party that was part of the game like everyone was in the communist party do you think because everyone was a communist and happy about it no because they had to right and so the, these mass surveillance tactics and th that is something that i grew to really really hate uh uh and disgust um and today you know um, i'm seeing that on a very different level <laughs> um on a very different level with a very different technology it's not anymore that you have to go to the you know uh, stasi and and report um but you know it's just take the data <laughs> the data is all there so that that's you know i think this um this this experience of of not being able to speak up uh not being able to travel uh to move out to have different opinions to be different than all the others because everyone had the same everyone should have been the same and you can see the same happening right now in China, for example. People get normalized. People, you know, if they don't behave as for expectations of the system, uh, then they get policed by their own friends through their social credit scoring, right? <clears throat> so it, it is, it's, it's those things are repeating and knowing history, understanding history is extremely helpful to realize um, and, and see the consequences ahead. A lot of my other guests have um, been through the fall of communism from a Ukrainian perspective, from, from being in Russia, from being in, in all parts of you know the Soviet Union and the satellite countries. Um, but some of my guests also came from Zimbabwe or came from Argentina. And so the, the common denominator there is that you've all grown up in this deep state or this you know overbearing state and you've seen firsthand what it's like when you have no control over your your liberty your information and more importantly your financial freedom and that's why you are in love with bitcoin so much and that's why you see this as not just a way to make money but you see this as a as a a life meaning for you it's what what you're put on this earth to do yeah, I, I never, I, I've never been to Bitcoin specifically for the money. Like money is great to have. It's great to, you know, earn enough uh, to to make a living. Um, 
I was always quite <clears throat> sober about money, uh, uh, but uh, the, the, the the vision of of using Bitcoin as a tool of freedom uh, that's that's very tempting. That's very appealing to me. So, in addition to um, starting these companies and being part of founding teams, you've also uh, forked in a way, and you got involved in charitable work. And I read that you. Um, are involved in or, fa- or part of the founding team of a charity called uh, Kodam et Bloom. Mm. Can you tell me about that? That was the original name. Uh, <laughs> so that's funny that you. A little hard up. to pronounce. No, no, that's that's okay. Uh, it it it, uh, it was a uh, initial uh, name of the project that later on transformed to the B, uh, and that was announced last year. Uh, unfortunately, prior to establishing, and you know, I so here's the thing: I wanted to create a, uh, a vehicle that could, you know, concentrate some money and support some research and development. There's a lot of people that were asking for some financial support, uh, and uh, I felt that we, we as a as Bitcoin. Uh, need, if I can say that we, Bitcoin we, uh, that we need more developers uh, and that we need a little bit more just, you know, education of the masses. And it's it's clear to me that even after 10 years into Bitcoin, people still have a lot of misconceptions and stuff like that. Uh, and I thought that um, inviting Giacomo uh, because he's like a, such a huge Bitcoiner and excited. And he also want, he also had this idea. Uh, so I invited him to, to do this with me. Uh, and because he was extremely excited about it, he wanted to announce it. And I was like, no, nah, Giacomo, maybe it's not a good idea. <laughs> because let's, let's establish first. And he was like, yes, but you know, Baltic Honey Badger is a great place to announce. He was right. So... I said, okay, uh, let's do it. And then we uh, came back, uh, we we came to Riga, we announced, and then um, uh, there was a problem with anonymous donations. So there was no go for us to start uh, doing this and keeping it completely anonymous. I didn't want to KYC Bitcoiners that want to give uh, their money, you know, to good purpose. I found that weird and then uh that is kind of weird the 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 country that's the law right that's i may have uh, found a um uh a solution uh recently i don't want to talk about it yet because for me the idea is still uh, not that despite the fact that we didn't really launch the way we we wanted to um I'm still uh, still working on this. <laughs> I'm I'm not uh, talking about it too much because it just creates a lot of um, I think too many emotions for for what it is really really. So you know there was a huge huge support and and actual need, but then there was also some uh, some pushback, uh, which was due to the fact that there was some Bitcoin Foundation before and. Uh, you know, you. I think you've been even a part of it. <laughs> I was, the, I was one of the founders of that, but it very quickly became something that it wasn't supposed to be. Uh, exactly. You know, and because people had uh, mar- the market had this experience, they drew uh, conclusions, and um, I'm I'm not blaming anyone, but uh, it made it a little bit hard to actually focus on what you need to do. The the concept of the Bitcoin Foundation was conceptualized by um, Gavin Gavin um, and myself in that in Austria actually in that meeting um, and the idea was was like you said was basically to create this organization for companies to pool resources together and do advertising and charitable work and things like that but it ended up being something completely different but and I, I resigned hmm. as its vice chairman but yeah, um, and you know there was Mark Carpellas was one of the the guys, and he just didn't have a very good reputation after after Mount Dogs, um, and and a few things. And you know, I I don't even want to dive into it. I I see there's a completely different uh, story. Um, all, and although I understand concerns, I don't think that you know people should be ju- judged by 
uh, by comparing to other people. <laughs> um, and so I'm still not giving up on this idea. Uh, I'm, I'm talking quite intensely with, uh, with someone uh, and I, well, I'll be hoping that by the time I get to Riga uh, that I will uh, be able to say this is how it's gonna, gonna happen. The movement of the movement in Bitcoin, and it's one thing to talk about it, but it's another thing to do, to 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 do it. You know, be your own bank, hold your own keys. You achieve that with with the Trezor. And the next, the next kind of like, um, the next thing that really, if you want to have control of your financial life, is to um, run your own node and to have your own physical device that's actually. Um, maintaining a copy of the Bitcoin ledger, the blockchain, and verifying these transactions. Um, and obviously, the more the more nodes on the network there are, the more decentralized the network. And you've managed to turn that actually into a business, and a business that people want to own. They want to have one. I wanted one. I got one very quickly, and I, I run it um, in my house. I run my own node um, using Casa Hodel. Um, tell me about that. Uh, yes, well, I, I met Jeremy um, in New York, and uh, that was funny because we were sitting on a security panel of some investor, uh, Bitcoin crypto investor conference, right? And I'm sitting there and I'm saying, you know, if anyone in the audience is, you know, thinking to invest a substantial amount of money into Bitcoin, then look into CASA, for example, because what they're doing is they're building a great multi-sig using other hardware wallets. So they're not trying to, to keep the keys and, and they make it fairly easy for people to use. And that was my first encounter with Jeremy. Um, and then we just went for a coffee and we talked and we talked a lot. Uh, and we realized that our visions of the world uh, align a lot and that um, you know, I had one of the reasons, you know, why I uh, kind of uh, phased out of, of Satoshi Labs was I had a lot of ideas that were maybe too early. <laughs> I tend to be very early, you know, and people tend to tell me like, well, no, that's not going to happen or, well, no, that's stupid or no, because that's like 10 years ahead and uh, sometimes it's much earlier. And I, so I had this, you know, a lot of, a lot of business ideas, a lot of things that could be done. And it was a little bit difficult to, to uh, create within Satoshi Labs because guys, they wanted to mainly focus on, on just what there was. And then, uh, you know, uh, we started to add a lot of altcoins and stuff. And so for me, uh, Trezor was a success. Uh, I, I, you know, made it happen, uh, and it was time to leave and and look for for new adventures. And so, as we're sitting with Jeremy Welch and talking about like, okay, I wanted to create this and that, and he was, oh wow, I was thinking about the same. And then I said, and this, and he was, and he was becoming pale. <laughs> Because he thought like this, this woman is a witch. She's reading my mind, or she hacked me, or I don't know. <laughs> it was a very like it was a very surreal meeting that we had, and <clears throat> you know it, it's like you, you could compare notes. Um, and one of the things was like uh, that that bothered me, and that you know as we talked about the surveillance, uh, is that the way the infrastructure today of the of the internet and everything is built uh that the, the fact that we are using uh, this mainframe you know the cloud computing and we have these slave clients and that the companies have everything about us um and knowing the the infrastructure of bitcoin and how we can tackle the risk on a you know distribute the risk and tackle on a pure personal level uh, that is something, you know, that I think could be applied to way further than just beyond transferring money, right? Uh, to, to transfer any kind of value, to, to be able to conduce, um, you know, some better, more privacy focused, more private, more sovereign way of, 
of life in the cyberspace, right? <laughs> so so the, the first project that I wanted to kick around in Casa was the, the Casa Note. Uh, you know, I joined the, the team prior to announcing uh, my involvement, uh, but basically this is something that Casa was already playing with. And I brought in some new team members, uh, Thomas and Thomas and Michael, that you know met met me just a couple of days before I met Jeremy and were showing me the prototype that they're building. And it was it was really really an exciting moment. So I, I I put them together with Casa, and the goal was just to make it easy. I always wanted to run a note, but I'm not technical. I'm not the the nerdy person. I'm the the user. Right, uh, so I would run AB Core <laughs> on my old Android, uh, but that never synced. <laughs> it was like always kind of lagging, and my 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 software note is still syncing, like six years later. It see, <laughs> it was. Don't even talk about my Ethereum note. It's not. It hasn't even started up yet. Mm-hmm. And so this this is a way for early. Adopters, this is you know uh, running a Bitcoin full node. This um, it should be uh, should be the omega in the alpha omega for for a sovereign Bitcoiner, but uh, running a Lightning is really for early uh, reckless <laughs> people who who want to support and want to play, but they don't have the skills and they don't have the time. And at the same time, you know, as we were building the the key management layer. Because that's that's like the the building stone of everything. If you if you don't have a good key management, you can build any decentralized applications or any storage or any node or anything basically, uh, and it will only work until your users lose their keys. <laughs> so we were as we were building this, we figured like okay, we we're providing the best security for uh, Bitcoin hodlers. Uh, out there, but uh, and we make them uh, sovereign. We tell them you are in complete control. But then uh, they would just, you know, send all the transactions through us, which doesn't make them completely in control. So another step is to create this kind of plug and play experience around the node, and plug and play experience around even you know protecting data, protecting your stuff, and and the new wave of home computing, as I call it. By the way, as you see, you know, we're playing a lot around the topic of home with Casa. Um, <laughs> it's like an analogy of the, on the home button, um, uh, something that, you know, you can call a home in the cyberspace uh, that is your own, that is your castle, that is your, your protection. Right? So that's the next step. And, you know, the future is open. <laughs> what are some other products that you guys are ready to launch can you talk about them uh well we keep on improving on on what we have today i think we've managed to launch way more stuff in the span of 12 months than than many other companies like casa is literally a team on steroids uh, because everyone is you know when a when a dhl van shows up in front of my house i know i have a package from from the czech republic (laughs) did it happen to you like you got a oh yeah yeah, I get I get stuff from you guys, especially because I I uh, I, I subscribed and then I'm I got your um what's it called the bag the the Hollandaise bag Faraday, what do you call it? Faraday 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 bag uh-huh. in Holland. but yeah yeah we so I keep getting US. stuff in the mail. By the way, we ship from US. Um, yeah, you know we we keep on adding uh, these little components because security and personal sovereignty is not you don't have one fix it all tool right you don't have one thing so uh, having a hardware wallet is a great start but that doesn't uh solve a lot of issues and uh you know i i'm i'm very proud of what we achieved with uh, with trezor and uh, especially the bit 39 uh which is which made it easy for people to just back up their wallets any kind of wallets not just hardware wallets uh, with 12 or 24 words. And it's great, right? Because that's the first time in the history where you can just do a backup of your stuff at the beginning before you start using it and then use the wallet, right? 
And when you lose it, you take the backup. And it's, it was for me, the first time I saw it, saw and understood, it was like magic. <laughs> then you recreate the same uh, balance and the entire history thanks to, to the Bitcoin blockchain, right? And uh, so that, that start, but then a lot of people struggled with how to protect the recovery seed. And they found themselves to be a, the single point of failure, right? Because even if you went through lengths and you, you use some very advanced Shamir secret sharing, then eventually, uh, or, you know, or splitting in any ways uh, your seed, eventually you had to do a recovery. You became a single point of failure. People wouldn't know like where to keep it. Should I do copies? Should I split them? Should I shuffle the the order of the words? So it's a it's a very new concept for our minds to 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 deal with. All of a sudden, your entire wealth relies on a piece of paper, and how well That's true. and how well you can protect it. And so we we thought you know we need to figure out a better way for people and and using a a seedless multi-six so our engineers came up with this uh, is just it's just beautiful because it reduces the complexity um, in a way that if you you know want to improve your uh, physical security then you create a multi-six why because you have uh, different devices in different locations and you do several signatures in order to, to send funds but then if you did this on your own, you would have, in the example of three or five, uh, you would have five devices or five wallets and five recovery seeds, and that's 10 items to protect. So that's too much. Like Nobody's going to do that. And that's also a reason why a lot of individuals did not use multisig uh, before, because it was just very complex to do and, and worrisome, right? It's well, there's a, there's a, usually it's like a lever system, right? So when, when something that is highly secure, you know, it goes up when something's like really highly secure, the more secure and decentralized and, and private it is, the user experience goes down. And then something with like a high user experience, usually you have low security, low privacy and low and lower ease of use and, um, and, and higher ease of use. But you've managed to, you've managed, everything okay? You've managed to um, take both and merge them together and basically have a very high, rich user experience, but at the same time retaining the privacy and, and the, um, mm. the um, ability for people to be their own bank. And, you know, the, and restricting the ability uh, to, for people to do dumb stuff. <laughs> with their scenes and you know <laughs> and look it's like uh we've all committed some uh some sins in, in the security sphere like even professional professionals lose keys professionals send monies to to unverified addresses you know if you remember bitpace um bitpace story those were all big guys that worked in in you know in a Bitcoin company, so they should know better, right? So it's it's a, a lot of uh, security really relies on on your uh, on the way you approach things and and how you deal so with with the tools that you have. Right? So we're kind of trying to prevent uh, the people from shooting themselves in the foot, and so that's why Casa, you know, has one of the keys uh, um, as. We, well, what I like to say, you know, we we never hold your keys, but uh, we hold your hand if you want to. Um, I like that. Right. And that's something that was quite missing in, in this business because you would have two options. You would have your own hardware wallet, one with a single key approach, right? So a single point of failure eventually, or... Or, okay, some extreme cases would go and study the Glacier Protocol and, you know, split the keys and go the extra lengths. But even people, you know, who have a lot of Bitcoins would not consider because it was just way too much work. And Or then on the other side of the scale, you would have the Bitcoin banks 
Right, so you give up complete ownership of, of, of your keys and there was nothing in between. So CASA is great there and the key management, I think, is extremely important to make it make it ready for my mom to use. If people want to follow you, how can they do that? Uh, they can do it on ideally on Twitter, Alena Satoshi. Um, yeah, that's the best. Are you Satoshi? <laughs> of course, aren't you? Yeah, I wish we're all Satoshi except for Craig Wright. <laughs> oh no, I'm about to get sued now for saying that. Well, uh, what I can definitely say that I am not Craig Wright. Yeah, I'm not Craig Wright either. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate this. Well, I really enjoyed this talk. It this was uh, um, uh, different than, than uh, most of the interviews. So thank you. That's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Thank you. And hopefully we'll meet in the future. I hope so too. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening. This episode of Untold Stories is sponsored by Scott Offord, the creator of Crypto Mining. Scott's a broker of ASIC mining gear and helps people buy and sell their miners. He created a Bitcoin mining profitability calculator and an interactive ASIC hardware comparison chart that you can find at cryptomining.tools. It's the only free online tool for calculating profitability and days to ROI. That includes the impact of the Bitcoin block reward having. The calculator lets you put in your estimated uptime to give you a more realistic profit projections. So check it out and find Scott on Telegram and Twitter at O-F-F-O-R-D-S-C-O-T-T. This episode of Untold Stories is sponsored by eToro, the smartest crypto trading platform and one of the largest in the world with over $1 trillion in trading volume per year. U.S. customers can trade the most popular crypto assets with low and transparent fees. And if you're not ready to trade yet, practice building your crypto portfolio with the eToro $100,000 virtual trading feature. Best of all, you can connect with 11 million other eToro traders around the world, myself included, to discuss trading, charts, and all things crypto. Create an account at eToro.com. Links in the show notes and build your crypto portfolio the smart way. New episodes go live every Tuesday at 7 a.m. EST. Links to our Apple and Spotify channels are in the show notes. You can also follow me on Twitter, Charlie Shrem, to continue the conversation. See you next week.